The following message is from King's Church 1066, based in Hastings, Bexhill and the surrounding area. For more information, head to our website, kings1066.org. So Jesus, we want to thank you that because you are alive, our preaching is not futile. Thank you that because you are alive, our faith is not futile. Jesus, we thank you that because you are alive, uh, those who have fallen asleep in you will live again. Jesus, we thank you that because you are alive, that changes everything. And we can draw near to a king who reigns, a king who is sovereign, a king who is seated on the throne, a, a king who is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus, because you are alive, we will live how exciting is that? And Jesus, we want to bring our praise to you. Oh, Jesus, you are alive. You are alive. And we give you all the praise and all the glory and all the adoration. Would you come again and do what only you can do as your word comes? Would you watch over it? Let it accomplish all that you desire and the purpose for which you sent it. Jesus, would you have your way in our hearts again this morning, we pray. Amen. Yeah, so today we will preach God's word. I've got my notes. We've got slides. Yes, indeed, we'll preach God's word. My name um, is Sam. I'm part of Kings. It's a real privilege to share uh, God's word with you. We will be continuing in our Abide series. Um, hopefully, uh, something comes. Uh, yes, there you go. Living a missional, fruitful life. Uh, two Sundays back, uh, Paul Edworthy was sharing with us. Um, I suppose to just summarize on the cruciality of mission, how crucial mission is. Uh, today I'll be picking up from the second part of John chapter 15, setting before us, if I'm very honest, some really heavy things, but it's all in the scripture. So we don't just take the nice bits, but we also open our hearts to the challenging and the difficult bits as well. Are we all on board? So this morning would be a bit difficult, but these are Jesus' words. And so please come on board with me as we turn in our Bibles to John and to chapter 15. I'll be reading from verse 18. Jesus speaking here. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now that word hate, it's, it's a pretty strong word. The world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. Basically, if they did these things to me, they'll do them to you as well. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name. Because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. Verse 26. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father he will bear witness about me and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning chapter 16 verse 1 i have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away i have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. 
It's interesting the things Jesus is touching on here. Uh, so basically, earlier on, he has uh, touched on the fact that, you know, he's the true Israel, basically the true vine. And if we're going to bear fruit, we've got to stay connected with him. In these verses, Jesus wants to make sure that his disciples really understood what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. Jesus wants to make sure that in as much as our relationship with him is a wonderful one, it doesn't mean that we will not have aggressive opposition as his disciples. This morning, we want to look at the whole subject of opposition to mission. Two Sundays back, we were looking at the cruciality of mission. Today, we want to look at opposition to mission. Jesus makes this warning very, very, very clear. His reason for making this clear is so that the disciples do not fall away. So he tells them about some of the challenging bits of doing life with Jesus. And his reason is that they do not fall away. We cannot be surprised that the world in which we live will reject us. Uh, the world rejects anyone who does not talk or act like it. The world rejects those who do not subscribe to its value systems. Hopefully, you've all worked that out. Constantly, as followers of Jesus, we are in a constant battle with the systems of the world. Terry Vego says, the Christian life is not like a battle. It is a battle. And every day, we're doing battle with the systems of the world. The world pressures us to change our views on the key things that we hold in the scriptures. Have you heard, have you heard people say to you before, oh, the Bible is a bit old-fashioned now. You should change the way you think. Have you heard that before? Yeah, the world will say that to you. As followers of Jesus, we've got to hold to the truth in the scriptures. Jesus wants us to know that. You see, abiding in Christ doesn't guarantee a trouble-free life. Being a follower of Jesus will come at a real cost. There will be exciting times, there will be times on the mountain, but there also will be times in the valley. But you see, this shouldn't put us off our stride. We should expect this and be prepared for it. We don't give up, but we keep going. Jesus says, I have told you these things so that you don't fall away from the faith. Four things I'd like to share with us quickly on the whole subject of opposition. And then hopefully I would help us with the way we should respond. But before then, I just would want to just highlight just a simple definition of Christian persecution or Christian hostility. Have we got that slide? So Christian persecution is any hostility experienced from the world because of one's identification with Jesus Christ. And this can include hostile feelings, attitudes, words, and actions. And I want to tell you the story of people like Fatih, whose village was attacked by militants and they killed lots of people in that village. Reason being that they were followers of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you the story of Roshan, whose church building was burned down because the people in his community did not like the fact that he was a follower of Jesus Christ. I think that in these parts of the world, Sometimes if we feel quite far removed from some of these things, but the reality is still there in the scriptures. As followers of Jesus Christ, we will face opposition. What's the first thing Jesus wants us to know from these verses? The first thing Jesus wants us to know is the fact that opposition is inevitable. It is assured it will come. Expect no different treatment, Jesus seems to be saying. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you as well. Basically, he's encouraging the disciples to know that they are going to continue the things he had called them to do. He was leaving to be with the Father, 
but the disciples were going to continue in that same stride, in the same world. Today, you and I continue in that same stride. We continue in the same world. We live in a world that has rejected God and rebelled against him. And Jesus tells the disciples the truth. He doesn't hide it from them. He says, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you as well. And Jesus gives uh, three reasons for this. The first thing he says is the fact that you and I have a new nature. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. Because of that, opposition will come. He says, you've got a new nature. Since you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, since you repented of your faith and put your trust in Jesus, he gave you a new nature. He has taken you out of the world. You are no longer a part of the world. Jesus says because of that new nature, opposition would come. Secondly, he also says that because we share his life, opposition will come. For the mere reason that we share, do you, do you know that you share Jesus' life? His life is now your life and my life. Because we share his life, opposition will come. I remember a few years, many years back, I was probably 16 or 17, and we'd gone for a sports tournament in, this is back in Accra in Ghana. All the secondary schools would get together for, you know, for football and athletics and all that. And a couple of boys, I was in a boys' school, a couple of boys from my school had gone to cause trouble. They had attacked boys from another school. I had no idea about this. All right, so three or four boys from my school attacked these boys. I had no idea. End of the sports event, I am gently striding along. Then suddenly I see a group of about 20 or 30 boys and they go, he is one of them. I'm thinking, one of who? At this point, they are charging towards me. I'm thinking, okay, they don't look very friendly. I've got to leg it now. Later, I will discover that obviously boys from my school had attacked boys from this school. And because I was, I was in the uniform of my school, they thought, well, he's one. Even though, I'll be very honest, I wasn't involved in the attacks. Okay, don't think that I wasn't involved. But the fact that I had the school shirt on, I identified with boys from my school. And so therefore, they could beat me up. I'm glad I legged it. And Jesus says, because we share his life, we will face opposition. Another reason why opposition is inevitable is to do with the whole subject of, you see, we as light in this world, wherever we go, we expose evil. Jesus makes it very clear. He is the light. He says, when I speak or the works I do, his miracles, he says that suddenly people realize that they are sinners. And you and I, it's the same. We, we bear this light. We are salt and light. And wherever we go, as long as we're living in this light, we will expose evil. And as you start exposing evil, sometimes you don't even have to say anything. By just being there, being salt and light, suddenly people become aware of the fact that they are not doing the right things. And that can lead to serious opposition. So Jesus says, it is inevitable. It will come. You consider integrity of speech, unwillingness to spread slander, words of kindness and forgiveness. Well, sometimes it will provoke opposition. It's rife in workplaces, with your neighbors, in the community, in places where you would find yourself. Sometimes, like I'm saying, you don't say a thing, but suddenly it feels like everybody is on your case. Jesus says, the fact that you expose evil means that opposition will come. Secondly, Jesus says, opposition may be terrible. Now, this is a hard one, but again, we've got to hear Jesus' words. You see, since Jesus is the standard for the treatment of the disciples, opposition may take the form of murder or death. Now, I know that is a hard one, but Jesus wants us to hear it. Could I please have those facts? It's the fact sheet.
Now, these are some key facts from the charity Open Doors. Apparently, one in seven Christians around the world are persecuted for their faith. 5,621 Christians were murdered for their faith last year. 2,110 church buildings or Christian buildings were attacked last year. 5,259 Christians were abducted last year. Anybody fancies being a part of that? I know, I know people who live in countries where there's constant persecution every day. Jesus wants us to hear it. Opposition may be terrible. Not only first century followers of Jesus, but even today, people continue to lose their lives. People continue to struggle because they are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is inevitable. It will come. It is assured. Secondly, opposition may be terrible. Number three, Opposition may come from respectable sources. It's interesting, in Jesus' time, a lot of the opposition came from the religious leaders. You think, why, why them? These were respectable people, people who knew the word of God in and out. But a lot of the opposition came from them. They opposed Jesus to his face. They, they opposed the disciples. It came from respectable sources. There was great resentment towards Jesus and, and his followers. And in fact, Jesus says, look, a time is coming when they will throw you out of the synagogues. And today, to a certain degree, they are, you know, religious fundamentalists who would pay people money to do terrible things to Christians. But I also want to say that Sometimes opposition comes from unsuspecting sources. For example, from the government, from people in government. I know countries where the government has effectively said, we are not going to allow these people to practice their faith. And so if they do, we're going to effectively shut them down. Sometimes opposition comes from people we respect and honor in society, well-educated, well-meaning people. Opposition can come from there. People will look at and think, oh, well, we want to honor you because you are this and this and that. Sometimes opposition can come from there, unsuspecting sources. It's not always somebody coming with a gun or a bomb or something. It's not always like that. Sometimes it comes from very unsuspecting sources. And Jesus wants us to be aware of that. Sometimes our bosses can give us a hard time as well, you know. Opposition can come from there if they are not Christian. They just don't like what you do, what you stand for. Opposition can come from there. Number four, Jesus says, this opposition, however, is endurable. I like that. I find that reassuring. The fact that it will be hard, but it is endurable. I remember a few, year, a few years back going to preach the gospel in some rural village in the eastern part of, of Ghana. And um, in a lot of those villages, they would have, they would have witch doctors. All right, and um, maybe here you don't see them. There you come face to face with them, and they'll say to you, they'll tell you things like, I'm going to kill you and things like that. And then you're wondering, okay, Jesus, you've got to help me with this one because I don't know how I'm going to fight this one. So we go and preach this gospel in this rural village, and um, no electricity, nothing. And so we, we get our tents, and we pitch our tents and things like that, and we're, we're sleeping, and it's, it's dark, no electricity, it's pitch black. And these guys, sometimes they just want to frighten you. And so they came and they were just going around and I'm, I'm, I'm in the tent thinking, oh dear, what am I doing here? What have I signed up for? It can be scary. But over the years, you discover that actually Jesus fights for you and Jesus is greater. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. If I'm very honest, I nearly put my tents back together and run back to the capital because they do, they scare you. And like I'm saying, they will say things to your faces. And sometimes you see these things happen. They will say to you, you will not live to see the next day. And the next thing is you hear news that a person has, you know, it's, it's hard. It can be scary. But Jesus comes along and he helps us see that actually he is seated on the throne. He is greater. He is mightier. He is stronger. 
Jesus wants us to know that. Opposition is endurable, one, because Jesus remains Lord in spite of all the opposition. He is still Lord. His authority, his sovereignty has not diminished in any way. Jesus is still Lord. Opposition is endurable because in the midst of it, we experience the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. Philippians 3 verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him. It's, it's a real privilege to get to share in the sufferings of Christ. He's not away from us. He is with us in it. Opposition is also endurable because our being opposed is a confirmation that actually we belong to Jesus. A real confirmation that we belong to Jesus. Because you belong to Jesus, you will be opposed. It's all I'm saying this morning. Because we belong to Jesus, we will be opposed. How do we respond? Five things and then I'll, I'll finish off. So opposition, like I said from the start, is inevitable. Opposition number two is, uh, could be terrible. Opposition could come from unsuspecting sources. And then finally, opposition is endurable. What should our response be in the face of opposition? The first thing I want to say to us, church, is this. Don't be surprised. When opposition comes, don't be surprised. Jesus makes it very, very clear. I have told you these things so that you would know and you would not fall away from the faith. So when opposition comes, don't suddenly go, oh, why, why me? Well, you, because you're a follower of Jesus. So when opposition comes, don't be surprised. 1 Peter 4 verse 12 says to us, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you as though something strange were happening to you. So don't wake up and suddenly go, what is this strange thing? What world am I living in? Well, opposition comes because you share Jesus' life. And so when it comes, do not be surprised. Unless, of course, one day you go, Jesus, I don't want to do this life with you again. But don't be surprised because it will come. Secondly, when opposition comes, I want to encourage you, church, don't look to man, look to Jesus. Look to God when opposition comes. 1 Peter 5 verse 10. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. I like reassuring verses like these. We are not alone. It says that Christ himself will come and restore and confirm and strengthen and establish you. Can I also just say quickly that we may not necessarily see all these things in this life. Let me just explain. When you read Hebrews, it says about how, you know, the heroes of faith, some of them were looking forward to all these things, but they didn't see them in their life. And I think that as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we've got to hold this tension of the now and the not yet. It's so important that, yeah, Jesus has come. And so we see expressions of his kingdom. Praise God for that. But Jesus' kingdom has not yet come in its fullness. And so at the minute, we do not see the fullness of Jesus' kingdom. But one day we know that when he comes again, we will see him and we will be like him. We will see his kingdom come in its fullness. There will be no tears. There will be no pain. There will be no sickness. But at the minute, we live in that attention of the now and the not yet. So sometimes we see healings. Sometimes we see miracles. Other times we do not necessarily see these things in their fullness. Is Jesus still seated on the throne? Yes. Is Jesus still king? Yes. Is Jesus still in control? He still is. Hallelujah. But we hold this tension and it can be frustrating. Of course I know Jesus can heal me. Of course, I know. Every time I pray, would you just take this tummy trouble away? I, I, know, I know he can do it. 
It hasn't yet happened. Every Jesus, would you? It's not very nice. It's it's uncomfortable. Would you? Would you please come? Would you take this thing away? I know, I know he can do it. It doesn't mean, therefore, that I turn my back and go, you are no longer Jesus. Church, I have seen him do some amazing things. And I'm not now going to turn my back and go, I know, no, 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 no. I trust Jesus through and through. But I also want to be honest and say, I don't always understand. Yeah, well, but Sam, you're a pastor. Yeah, but who says pastors understand everything? Oh, but Sam, you're an elder. But who says, no, 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 no. Sometimes I do not understand. And so I hold the tension of the now and the not yet. But do I continue to trust? Yes, because he is all that he says he is. My experience shouldn't define who God is. No. Your experience should not define, you know, God is God. And he shows glimpses of his grace in your life and our experiences do not define him. No. The fact that I haven't received healing doesn't mean God doesn't heal. We've seen people pray. Where's Sarah? Are you here? You've prayed for people. You've seen healing. God heals. God heals. He does. But it's, it's just that tension. Maybe a bit like Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. God, I'm struggling. Help me. My grace is sufficient. Well, one day at a time. Look to Jesus. Don't look to man. Sometimes we need to repent because it could be that we have actually brought that opposition upon ourselves. You see, if, if I work in a place where I'm constantly gossiping, where I'm constantly backbiting, of course, people will oppose me. I don't turn around and go, they are doing that because I'm a foot. No, 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 no. They are opposing me because I'm doing the wrong thing. And I think that sometimes we need to look at our very own lives and then see whether there's a need for us to repent. Number four, this is a hard one. Love the people who oppose you. Ooh, ooh, ooh. It's, it's, it's there in the scriptures. Jesus says, love your enemies. 1 Peter 3 verse 9. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. What? Bless the people trying to do bad to me? Yeah, don't repay evil for evil, Jesus says. Finally, Remember your Christian family, 1 Peter 5, 9. It just highlights the fact that we are not the first ones to face opposition. We are not the last ones. We're not the only ones who are suffering. Remember brothers and sisters in other parts of the world who are suffering. When you face opposition, let the Spirit of God take you on the journey so that you can remember brothers and sisters in places like in India, brothers and sisters in places like Nigeria, brothers and sisters in places like Nepal who are suffering and facing opposition. You are not the first. You are not the only ones. We are not going to be the last ones, but let the Spirit of God take us on a journey. Finally, I just want to say to us, when it comes to opposition, the only thing we need to do is to look to Jesus again and see Jesus for who he is. So we're just going to finish off with a video. Just sit down. It's just a worship song. Let the words speak to your heart. Let, let the Spirit of God help you just fix your eyes on Jesus again. Because something, something, something in the whole area of just looking to Jesus just helps us begin to see him for who he is. And um, even though there's lots of opposition still around, we don't necessarily see opposition for what it is because we see Jesus enthroned, high and lifted up. Amen.